Good evening, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Hello. You guys ready for Worship Wednesday? Woo. Okay. So I'm just going to pray and get things started. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. I thank you for Pastor Tim's heart to want to teach and um, explain things to us that we can grow deeper in the word. We thank you for what you're going to do tonight, Have a that your Holy Spirit is just going to be able to move in abundance. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Help me welcome him to the stage. So, uh, Pastor Alex, what a great job he did last week, didn't he? I was, I love him. He's a fellow nerd. I appreciate so much. So, if you did your pre-work uh, this week, I'm so excited because you watched, in my opinion, one of the best videos I've ever seen. Uh, the Tree of Life video is just so, so good. And if you hadn't had a chance to watch it yet, go back and watch that video. I know there's people like sharing it on social media. It really is that good. And so I want to do a little bit of recap. Page one of the Bible, which we've spent several weeks on, in a sense, as you will see, uh, the rest of the Bible kind of recapitulates or goes over what we studied in chapter one. The whole Bible, in a sense, is riffing off of this idea of creation as a cosmic temple in space and a cathedral in time. And that theme carries throughout the Bible. Well, we studied last week, page two of the Bible. In a sense, the rest of the Bible is about what you studied on page two. The rest of the Bible is connected to humans as being the, the cosmic priesthood in this cosmic temple where heaven and earth overlap in this garden Something's going to happen with that, but that is the purpose. And you can see that purpose also kind of foreshadowed in what happens with the creation of the bride who comes from the side, Sela, rib is probably an unfortunate translation, but from the side of the ish comes this isha, from the man comes this woman. And together, what says the, the one becomes two, and then what happens? They become one. Again, one of the things I wanted to reiterate, I thought Pastor Alex did a great job, but I just want to reiterate, it's very important, is this idea of what it means when the Moses team writes that the woman is, in English translation, a helper or help meet, I think, King James is. What, what does that mean? And the word there in the Hebrews, azer. And virtually every other time when Azer is used in the Bible, most of the other times it's used, it it's in use with God. He is our Azer. So how does this apply to woman? The idea of helper, which is, which is a great word that it's translated, helper, it's, it's appropriate. But there's, in English in the 21st century, we have different ideas of what a helper is. One idea is like a subordinate, someone that you just hire to help out with certain things and you order around. Like, think of a, of a butler. Butlers are great, but you know what I'm saying. This is, this is the help. Another concept of helper is, let's say you're in an accident, you're laying in the middle of the road, bleeding everywhere, and you're screaming help, and the ambulance shows up. They're your helpers, right? Are they subordinate to you? Are you looking down on them? Are you ordering them? I hope not. Uh, when I had emergency spine surgery, my surgeon, he was my azer. Now, this is, this is not somebody that I'm looking down on. And, and he, he's my azer. He was my help. And so uh, and one way to think of it is first responder. First responder. And that is what Isha, the woman, was intended to be. So nobody is trying to be over anybody else. It's different roles. And you have the source, which is the ish. He is the, the head, like the head of a river, the source from which information flows, good things flow. And then you've got the first responder, who is very, very important too. So in many ways, the rest of the Bible is the story of this bride. And we saw how uh, the New Testament writers talked about that as relating to the church. So another thing are these two trees. You've got this tree of life that's associated with Yahweh Elohim's eternal presence. And then you've got the tree of knowing Tov and Ra. And 
as Pastor Alex said now, knowing the difference between good and bad is not in itself evil, as we're gonna see later, but trying to learn the difference from good and bad on our own terms is certainly evil, as we will see. So let's go into uh, chapter three, verse one. Now, the Nachash was more arum than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And it said <laughs> to the Isha, to the woman. So stop right here. This is Nachash, Hebrew snake. And it's somehow this snake is Arum. It's Arum. Pay attention. Keep that word in the back of your mind. It's going to come back to us. Shrewd is a good way to translate it. So this is a snake that is a room, it's shrewd, but it's also a beast of the field. What's going on with this? And it's, it's a talking snake. I love the Bible. It's got a talking snake on page three. This is, I, I don't know, I love this. So if you're an ancient Israelite and you're listening to this being read to you for the first time, all of it, you've got a category for this. You've already got a category for this because remember, Genesis 1 through 11 is in dialogue with these other traditions. So in your mind, you've got these other traditions that you've known since you were a little kid of chaos creatures. And this Nachash, you immediately, okay, well, it's a beast, but it's also more than a beast. It sounds to me like a chaos creature, plus it's a snake. So what other snakes were they? Remember the seven-headed, you know, uh, chaos Dragon, water dragon creature, Tiamat from the Enuma Elish. Uh, so you've got that in your head. And you also just came from Egypt. And you know what, how the pharaohs deck themselves out. We have examples today in gold and sarcophagi where the pharaohs are associated with this Urias that comes from, you know, their crown. It's a snake that comes from the crown. So, yeah, they know about snakes. In Egypt, the serpent was the first offspring of primeval earth. So here, here they've got a category, and it's not a good category. In the Hebrew Bible, though, snakes are not always bad. They're not always bad. If you uh, have read some of the prophets, you know about the seraphim. It's an angelic creature that is serpentine and has wings. It's multiple wings, six wings. So there is a later meditation on the third page of the Bible that sees this Nachash as a corrupt seraph, as a corrupt one of these creatures that is usually before the throne. Um, therefore, when cursed, losing its wings. And in time, uh, biblical authors associate this snake with the Satan, which means the adversary, in New Testament, the devil. So, but, there, but there's more to that. So I just want to prepare you because we're going to go deeper into that right now. The Nahash <laughs> is a beast of the field. So the implication is whatever spiritual being status is held by this chaos creature, it's also physical. It's wearing some kind of snakeskin outfit. So on a literary level, this is so important when you're reading the Bible. I want you to see the serpent is not just a particular character. It is, in this case, the devil. But the serpent is also a recurring role that is, like the snakeskin, gets put on by different characters at different times. So, best analogy I could think of, and it's probably terrible, but anyway. You remember back in the day, or maybe back in your parents' day, there were these black and white Japanese monster movies. Yeah, they were like so good. And it was awesome because as you're watching and they have English, they're dubbed in with English and these guys would talk and they'd say, oh no, the monster, he's coming. You know, it's like, oh, I mean, where, do you, how, where can you find that today? But, but the favorite and my favorite of the Japanese monster movies were surrounded by this incredible character, Godzilla. And you remember Godzilla? 
I'm not talking about like the new Godzilla movies, some of which are okay, but, but I mean, that's when it was real, right? And it's, I mean, look at that thing, he's huge, and those poor people in the trains. It's, so Godzilla, right? The thing is, <laughs> Godzilla was a rubber suit. And you can bring up the next picture. So, yeah, this is, this is I, I hate to like kill the butterfly here, but, but the first fellow, and actually a long time wearer of the suit, but not always, was an actor named Haruo Nakajima. Haruo Nakajima. So Haruo Nakajima is wearing this rubber Godzilla suit, especially for the first movies. But was he Godzilla? No, sometimes another actor would come in and put on the rubber Godzilla suit. And it, and it didn't matter. You got the idea. This is still Godzilla. In the Bible, narratively, the snake or is, is a rubber Godzilla suit that different characters sometimes wear. And if you're, and not, they're not always bad. Sometimes they're just, okay, that was a bad decision. You did something bad, but God eventually uses them. Perfect example is Jacob. Jacob, multiple times, wears the rubber Godzilla suit. He wears the snake skin. And he fulfills the narrative role of the Nachash. Sarah does at one time. Um, in fact, there's a whole kind of replay, in one instance at least, of what happens here in chapter three, that Sarah and Abraham and Hagar are kind of replaying, where Sarah is like, you know what? God, I don't wanna, we can't wait for God. Look how old we are. We gotta take matters into our own hands here. So you just do what you need to do with my slave. Doesn't really matter what she says, my Egyptian slave. So she is like the, the tempter. She's wearing the rubber Godzilla suit. And Abram is like the Isha, the woman. You know, say, like, okay, I'm gonna take the forbidden fruit. And Hagar is the forbidden fruit. You, you see how it works? It's not always exact. There's, sometimes they're missing one of the roles. Sometimes there's an extra role in there. But this pattern that we see in chapter three is going to replay over and over and over and over again. David and Bathsheba, over and over again throughout the Hebrew Bible. So let's look at this word arum or shrewd. There's a major word play that is coming up here. Arum is not a, necessarily a bad word. It's like, oh, you, you're street smart. You, you've got practical wisdom. You, you, know, you know which stocks to buy, right? You just, th this is how, I mean, they didn't have stocks and bonds then, but this is the idea here with the Nahash, is the Nahash, you know, this thing has been around and he's got some street smarts. Next verse, indeed, he says, as he's talking to the Isha, has Elohim said, you shall not eat from any eights of the garden? So this is such a corrupt question. And partly because it can be interpreted in multiple ways. He's not outright contradicting Yahweh Elohim. But he's kind of opening the door through his arum, his shrewdness, to bring suspicion. So, he, and notice he doesn't call uh, the Lord Yahweh Elohim, but just Elohim. He's acknowledging that he's a spiritual being. He's not using the term Yahweh. And, verse two, the Isha said to the Nachash, oh, from the fruit of the eights of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the eights, which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Okay, so the Isha, seeing that there's more than one possible meaning to the Nachash's question, uh, answers both of them. Yes, we may eat of any of the eights, except we may not eat of one of them. Note that she says that this eights, this tree is in the middle of the garden. What else do we already find is in the middle of the garden? The tree of life. 
So these trees are very close to each other. It's almost as if you have to go by this tree to get to that tree. And then she misquotes Yahweh Elohim. She misquotes him. She said, you can neither eat nor touch it. A lot of meditation on what's going on here. Some said that she's making stuff up like the Pharisees and additional law. Some say maybe, uh, you know, the ish, uh, the male who originally got this information before she was made, gave her incorrect information. That's possible. Or maybe she is, as an azer, just setting an additional boundary. So it's like, you know what? I think it's better if we don't even touch this thing, for, let alone eat it. Don't know. It's ambiguous. And she says, or you will die. Now, this is a very correct recollection of the instruction of Yahweh Elohim. Remember, instruction means Torah, or Torah is the word for instruction. So the first Torah is don't eat this. Eat these, don't eat this one. So the instruction that God gave about the tree of knowing Tov and Ra is actually the first step of learning Tov and Ra. So learning Tov and Ra is not in itself a bad thing. We all have to do that. Children, you don't need to do that, as Pastor Alex explained last week. Knowing Tov and Ra is wisdom, right? It's, it's how you get along in life and you learn good things. But what is the beginning of wisdom according to Proverbs 9, 10, and I think it's Psalm 111. The beginning of wisdom is the, it's the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is an ancient idiom for I follow this, this one. So fear of Baal would mean I follow Baal, you see, or Baal. I follow Yahweh means that, or I fear Yahweh means I follow him. Fear is used as kind of like respect on steroids. So the idea is, I'm, well, I listen to this one because I'm following this one. And that's the sense that Proverbs is using in fear of the Lord. So if they listen to Yahweh Elohim who says, don't eat from this tree, and they follow that instruction, that Torah, they've begun the process of wisdom, right? But it's also called the tree of knowing Tov and Ra. It seems like we could take a shortcut and just take that on our own terms. So, the Nachash, well, it's a little quote here. I don't know if this is, anyway. The irony is that Yahweh Elohim was teaching them the knowing of Tov and Ra by creating a boundary between the humans trusting him or grabbing wisdom in their own eyes. But this Nachash wants the humans to just wander off the path of life by inviting them to kind of slither past the boundary of instruction and set off into the wilderness of self-sovereignty. It's, what I decide is good and bad. Verse four, the Nachash said to the Isha, to the woman, you surely will not die. For Elohim knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes are gonna be opened and you will be like Elohim, knowers of Tov and Ra. So, you will not surely die. It's kind of contradicting Yahweh, Elohim, but with an asterisk. It can mean, this is a cleverly worded phrase, which can mean surely you won't die, or it could mean, well, it's not really sure that you're gonna die. It's intentionally worded so it can be interpreted either way. You see the arumness of this nachash, how shrewd, and he says, for. Elohim knows that your eyes will be opened. Idea here is why would Elohim want to withhold an apocalypse or a revelation of wisdom from you? That seems strange, doesn't it? You know, you eat this, you're going to be like Elohim. In some way, you're going to actually assume more of his nature and more of his character. I mean, isn't that what the Tselem, the Tselemim, imagers are supposed to be doing? Well, you'll be better imagers because you're going to be more like him. Why would Elohim let you die for just fulfilling your purpose? 
And he says, don't you want to be knowers of Tov and Ra? Isn't it good to learn wisdom? This is very compelling when you think of it in these terms. So here, here are these humans. Well, here's this, I mean, it's, it's, it's a beast. But it's obviously not just a beast. <laughs> and it's very a room. Don't we want to be a room? I want to be a room. And this one's a room. It's making sense. This thing is right here. Looks good. So this is where things turn. And the Isha, this is the Azer. This is the first res responder here. She saw that the Eitz was good for eating and that it was desirable to the eyes and that the Eitz was desirable to make one wise. The word there for wise is sakal. It's like successful. It's kind of going off this arum shrewdness thing. Wow. So she went ahead and took from its fruit and she ate and she gave also to her ish with her. Oh, the ish was with her. He was with her this whole time, this whole conversation. And he ate and apocalypse, <laughs> the eyes of both of them were open. They were. Suddenly, they knew something about Tov and Ra, didn't they? And were they a room? Shrewd? Actually, what happened is they saw that they were a room. They were nude. <laughs> they didn't really become shrewd. They became nude. You, you see the wordplay? What's going on here? Not a room, but a room. And so they got to do something about this. So they sew fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So this is what's going on. The Azer, she corrupts her function as a first responder by evaluating this choice, not in the light of Yahweh Elohim's wishes, but in light of her appetite. So it was good for eating. That's the lust of the flesh in light of her own, own individual perception of beauty, because it was desirable to the eyes, it says, this is the lust of the eyes, and also her personal ambition. It was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. So this, the authors here are not looking to make her into a villain. They're looking to make her a mirror Be so that we can look and say, uh-oh, <laughs> have, have I ever made a decision based on what seemed good, I really wanted it, I craved it, what seemed beautiful to me and, you know, was going to help me get ahead. And those were the reasons that I made this decision. Is it only me? <laughs> you see, when, when she's a mirror, how it affects everything. So this is an actual design pattern. It's just repeated throughout the entire Bible, including the whole book of Genesis. And we're gonna see it actually repeated more than once in Genesis 1 through 11. I like how John, the apostle, reflects on this in his first letter, chapter two, verse 16. He says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, from the world. He's riffing off of this. He understands it very, very well. So she saw, she took, she ate. This is another extremely important repeated design pattern throughout the whole Bible. See, see it? Looks good, I'm gonna take it, and then I'm gonna consume it. This is what David did sent, you know, on his rooftop. He saw Bathsheba, he decided to take her and had his way with her. So, but over and over again. So, all right, when you see, where, what part of your body is your seeing located? It's up here, isn't it? Right? Near the top of your head. When you take something, what part of the body is located there? If you're right-handed, it's your right hand. Left-handed, it's your left hand. But you, you grab it. Most people are right-handed. Right? So up near your forehead and near your right hand. And so what this nachash, this beast, is saying is use this and use this to just take wisdom on your own terms. 
So John, who has got this whole thing deeply embedded in his mind as we saw from his first letter, he's just like a top tier expert in Genesis 1 through 11. Notice that in the book of Revelation, what the mark of the beast, where that goes, here and here. That's not, I mean, there's other, don't think that's the only thing, right? But it's deeply, definitely connected in a literary way to this. It's so wild. Anyway, there's a lot more to that, but we'll have to wait for the book of Revelation in some future decade to do that. All right. And then she took, she ate, and then she gave. This is another repeating design pattern throughout Scripture that Jesus turned upside down and redeemed. We'll talk about that more when we get to Jesus. And what happened to the Ish? He ate. He ate. Just like the Isha corrupted her function as Azer by failing in her charge of first responder, there was no protection or advocacy going on here. It's just, here, eat this. The Ish also corrupts his function as head, meaning the source, like the source of a river, by ignoring the instruction, the Torah, with which he was charged and which flowed through him to her. So this is not about role reversal. It's about role corruption in the pursuit of self-sovereignty. Both of them totally failed in their correct functions by deciding we're going to do this our way. And their eyes were opened. So immediate apocalypse. They didn't realize, they, <laughs> they realized they were a room. No, they realized they were a Rome. Nakedness in the Hebrew Bible is a biblical metaphor. Remember the Bible's imagistic, the Hebrew Bible especially. It's a biblical metaphor for shame, for shame. So here's the Isha and the Isha. They came from one flesh, they became two, and they came together as one flesh. Should there be any shame between them? No, there should not be. They're in the priesthood of the cosmic temple. They're one flesh. There's no shame between them. But now this act has made them ashamed in front of each other. The trust has been broken between them. The one who became two to become one, they've now become two again. They're going to spend the rest of their days striving with one another in lack of complete trust. So they got to cover up because they no longer trust each other. So what they do is they, they go to the garden and they take some leaves off of a tree. They're abusing a tree, right, to make loin. Have you ever seen a fig leaf, like a big fig leaf? It's perfectly suited for this, right, as a loincloth. We used to have a fig tree. Anyway, so, you know. Never mind. So not only, not only did they cause the problem by doing what seemed right in their own eyes, they tried to fix the problem by doing something that made sense in their own eyes. They're still doing what seems to make sense to them. They took from yet another tree to hide the shame of taking from the tree of Tov and Ra, of knowing Tov and Ra. So here they are, you know, wearing fig leaves, and they hear the kol of Yahweh Elohim. This is the sound, the kol of Yahweh Elohim. And he's walking in the garden. I know some translations will say the cool of the day, but the word here is ruach. He's walking in the ruach of the day. So what are you supposed to think? You, you know Genesis 1 very well. Oh, so God's interaction and presence with humanity is just like the Ruach of the Lord over those chaos waters. It's, it's a fresh new experience and intimacy with him. It's the spirit of God, right? It's the Ruach of the day. It's not just evening time. So here's this spot in the garden, though, <laughs> that has become Tohu Vavohu again. This is what we're supposed to kind of say, whoa, something just happened where, yeah, we need a ruach, all right, because disorder has crept in, chaos has crept in. And the human and his wife, the Isha and the Isha, they, notice I'm not using the name Eve. Have you all noticed that? It's, it's a real name, obviously. We're going to get to that shortly. But up to this point in the narrative, it is not used. So I'm just sticking with the terms that the narrative is using, and I think it's important. 
I think that her name comes at an important time and it says something. So I'm just going with what the narrative is calling her and him at this point. So they hid themselves among the trees. Well, they've got fear of the Lord all right now, but it's a different kind of fear. The fear of the Lord, which is supposed to be respect on steroids and following, has now twisted into terror of what he might do because the fear of the Lord, it's not just a gift anymore, it's a concern about the consequences. Reverence is terror now. And here they are among the trees hiding. This is the third abuse of the garden. First one was taking from the tree they weren't supposed to. The second one was trying to cover themselves with one of the trees in the garden. And the third one is trying to hide among the trees. So they violated their relationship with God. They violated their relationship with each other, which is why they were ashamed. And, now they've, and they've also violated their uh, relationship with the cosmic temple, with this garden, with this holy place where they are interacting with God. Heaven and earth are overlapping. This is the holy place. So verse nine, and Yahweh Elohim called to the Adam, to the human, and said to him, Ayeka, Ayeka, means where are you? I don't know, there's something about hearing it in the Hebrew. Ayeka, just breaks my heart. Does God know where the Adam is? So why would he say, Ayeka? So if you've ever had the experience of raising children, there's a certain age of toddlers <laughs> where let's just say you leave them alone for two minutes and then you go to the kitchen, it's like, hmm. And you hear this crunching sound, you hear this like bag crumbly and munching and you see crumbs falling from beneath one of the cabinets and you know what's going on, right? Somebody found the bag of cookies and is hiding. And you're like, Oliver, where are you? You know where Oliver is, or whoever it is. You're giving them a chance to come clean. That's what this is about. This is the first of three different opportunities that Yahweh Elohim gives for them to come clean. So this is what the human says. Oh, I heard the call of you in, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was a Rome. And I hid myself, naturally. And he, this is Yahweh Elohim, said, okay, who told you that you were a Rome? Have you eaten from the eights of which I commanded you not to eat? So the Adam, he totally um, does not answer the first question. However, this, have you eaten from the eights of which I come in? This is opportunity number two to come clean for him to say, you know what? I sure did. I sure did. And I deserve whatever's coming. I am so sorry. I repent. I feel awful. Now, I mean, bad things are happening already. But this is instead what happens. And now, this is not about what would have happened if he had come clean. Uh, this is where our minds go, right? But this is not the narrative goal here. The narrative goal is to see in ourselves similar things that are happening. So the Adam said in answer to, you know, did you eat from this tree? Well, the Isha, <laughs> whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the eights and I, I ate. The Isha whom you gave, I mean, he doesn't come clean at all. The Adam, he, his response is to cast blame. And he's not just casting blame on the woman, he is. He's casting blame on God. He's blaming God for this. This is wild. So he's not repenting, he's gaslighting. And then he throws his wife totally under the bus. This is why they don't trust each other. You see, this is why they're trying to cover themselves up because they know this is, uh, no, I'm not defending you. If you can take the hit for this, 
we're going to make this happen. Really? And so Yahweh Elohim says to the Isha, what is this you have done? Third opportunity to come clean. This is time to the first responder. And the Isha said, the Nachash <laughs> deceived me and I ate. Is this true? Yes. But this is not coming clean. So this is the third invitation to repent, which is rejected. The Isha follows her husband's lead by blaming someone, something else. So is she really being a first, good first responder here? No. The subtle shift has taken place. The husband is already starting to rule over his wife. They're not helping each other. They're not fighting for the bottom to lift each other up. This is not, not you know, anything about one flesh anymore. This is now starting to look a little bit like a power play. It gets much worse. And Yahweh Elohim said to the Nachash, this is a confrontation we're looking forward to, because, because you have done this thing. He doesn't give the Nachash an opportunity to come clean. Did you notice that? You are Arar. I want you to remember that word, circle it. You are Arar. This is the first instance we have of the word curse. And the word is Arar. That's going to become very significant when we finish the flood narrative. You are Arar. You are cursed more than every beast and more than every Chava, living creature of the field. On your belly you will go and dust will you eat all the days of your Chava. So, just interesting meditation. The first Arar, the first curse in the Bible, goes to this creature who caused one of his little ones to stumble. So if, if this Nachash was a seraphim, and I, that's debatable, think in terms of losing the wings. I don't think there's a losing legs, right? But possibly losing wings. And now he eats dust. So where did humans come from? Yeah. That is a clue to what's going to be happening with this snake skin, with this rubber Godzilla suit is there's going to be this consuming quality to this deceiver that we're going to see in the next chapter. Okay. And I will set hostility between you and the Isha and between your seed and her seed. He will strike shuf your head and you will shuf his heel. So he's going to set hostility here. This is the curse upon the Nachash. Instead of the Isha being in alliance with the Nachash, which is what the Nachash wanted, let's see if I can bring these over into my team, <laughs> which is not a good team to be on. They're going to be enemies. So your seed and her seed. All right. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with this, but it has to be addressed. You know how I normally approach people that um, disagree, that I disagree with, and have various theories. And, and it's really the way to approach the Bible is to be humble about our own thoughts and studies, just to be humble. Because at any point, we could learn something and say, you know, I think I was slightly off. If I, you know, st stood on being exactly right about everything 25 years ago, I, I, I wouldn't have learned anything. So there are very few occasions where you're gonna just hear me say, this idea is flat out wrong. Very, very few. Because I want to be respectful. People are in different places. But there is an idea that I do want to say in this instance, I think it's important to say, is flat out wrong. It should be avoided at all costs. And that is the idea that the seed of the serpent is uh, Satan having sex with Eve and producing Cain and anyone from that line is a serpent seed. Uh, yeah, I know. It's this whole theology. And it's been dangerous. It's been destructive. It has led to racism. It has led to the opposite of what the New Testament is trying to teach. And you start to hear stuff like that, 
I would just, you know, smile and, and shut the doors of your heart and mind. Just, and you know, and does that mean that spiritual beings cannot have sex with humans? It doesn't mean that. But in this instance, this is not the point. And we know it's not the point because of how the narrative unfolds. Serpent seed people can be people that are just people, and sometimes they can actually turn and follow Jesus. There is no genetic component to this. So this is why I write, this is not a race of snake humans through the line of Cain who become Illuminati. And I, if you want to just go into that dark rabbit hole, you can, but I don't recommend it. So he will, but this is so critical. He, this is the descendant of the woman, is going to strike your head. And you, not his seed, but you will strike his heel. This is probably the, it's the first and most important prophecy in the Bible. From now on, the reader of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible, is supposed to be asking, every time there's a new story, who is the snake crusher? Noah, Noah shows up. It's like, oh, this is, oh, there's, oh, the stuff that happens around Noah, and he's a righteous, this could be the snake crusher, and it's not. Abraham, I mean, there's a, Abraham's a fresh start, right? Abraham does some great stuff, and some bad stuff, but he does some great stuff. This could be the snake crusher. He's not. What about Moses? Moses. I mean, look, Moses. He's not the snake crusher. David, man after God's own heart. He's definitely not the snake crusher. Solomon, the, the way the Solomon story starts out, it's like checking off all the boxes. Snake crusher, snake crusher, snake crusher. This is the guy. Not the guy. So each time the biblical authors raise the reader's expectations and then dash them, and so we're always supposed to have this question in the back of our minds as we read every narrative of the Hebrew Bible. And what's so amazing is that it's never resolved in the Hebrew Bible. It's left an open someday. You see why everybody's minds were, there was a category for Jesus. This is, this is Messiah language here. So to the Isha, he said, this is the Lord speaking, I greatly multiply your itzamon, your grief, in your conception. In etzeb, in grief, you will birth children, and your desire will be for your husband, your ish, he will rule over you. So Yahweh cursed the snake, and he's about to curse the ground, but he's, this is not a curse. This is not an arar, not in any way, shape, or form. I know that that's a lens you might have to, but an ancient Hebrew reader would have been not thought of this as an arar. It's not an arar. It's not even in that form. His words to the humans, both of them, are written in the manner of Hebrew lament literature. This is a predictive lament. It's like, here's what's going to happen. So first of all, I'm going to have to multiply your grief in childbirth and conception. That's what's going to happen. And now you're going to have this desire over your husband, but he's going to rule over you. These are the lamentable consequences of the big fail, the big test fail. It's not God's ideal. God's not telling the woman how he wants things to be. Now, really, if you want to live in my perfect plan and purpose, you're going to have all this grief about conception and having children. Isn't that great? That's, he's not, you see what I'm saying? This is a lamentable consequence that he is predicting is going to happen. And how do I know this? Because it happens through all the rest of the stories in Genesis. Almost every one. And through the rest of the Hebrew Bible. We see this all over the place. So this is, this is kind of preparing us as readers. Hey, this is what you're in for when you read this, you know, Tanakh here. You're going to see these things happening all over the place. In grief, she will conceive and bear children. In anxiety and grief over conception or the inability to conceive, it's like a central theme in the rest of Genesis from chapter 12 on. Grief over children who are actually born is also a central theme in the rest of the Hebrew Bible, starting in the next page. This is not primarily 
referring, or even necessarily referring at all, to the pain of the act of childbirth. This is getting us ready. It's this having children thing, it's going to be a problem, starting on page four. And then your desire will be with him and he shall rule over you. This is not just sexual desire that he's talking about here. The idea is that each one is going to try in different ways to have a clash of wills. Male dominance is not God's command. He's not saying my perfect will for humanity now is for women to be subject in every way and, and ruled over and dominated. That's, that's, it's a lamentable consequence of doing what was good in her own eyes. This lack of trust, you now have power plays taking place and who's the physically stronger? So this is what's gonna happen. He's gonna rule over you. It's, it's a lament. God sees what will result from humans walking away from the Eden ideal. The husband rules the wife in the whole rest of the narrative of the, of the Hebrew Bible, sometimes in horrible ways. And it stems from this. Although some, a lot of times the wife will find ways to usurp that. It's like she's got her ways too. This is the meaning of them being naked and ashamed before each other. You see what's happened here? And then, okay, now he's turning to the dude. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the whole of your wife, this is a phrase that comes up at other times, and you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, arar is the Adama on account of you. In Itzabon, grief, same kind of grief of a woman having children, you will eat from it all the days of your chava, Thorns and thistles shall sprout for you. You will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread until you return to the Adama, because from it you were taken, for you are dust. What's the Nachash going to eat? And to dust you will return. So listen to the voice of your wife becomes a theme in other places. Just tuck that away. So Arar is the Adama. Instead of the ground being a nursery of creativity and priestly working and keeping, it functions as an obstacle from which the humans will struggle to eke out subsistence. And the grief is the same word as used for the women here. So let's skip to verse 20. And the Adam called the name of his Isha, Chava, in English, Eve. This is when she gets her name. First time. And he's calling her this, for she is the mother of all Chava. And remember how they made themselves some fig leaves, loincloths? Elohim made for Adam and his Isha garments of skin, and he clothed them. So the Adam names his wife. Remember how he named the animals? So what's he doing? He was ruling over the animals, right? So he, one of the things of ruling is you name them. Now he's naming his wife. The first power play. I mean, it's a great name. It's, I mean, if you're going to get a name, life, that's a good name. But naming in the ancient Near East means a higher position. Tenderness is now mixed with jockeying for power. So Elohim, remember he said they were going to die <laughs> the day that they, remember that? The narrator remembers it. He can kill him at this point in fulfillment of his warning that they would die when they ate the fruit. But instead, the innocent die. He covers them with skins. The innocent are dying in their behalf. That's a theme. It's an imperfect substitute, of course. They're alive, but death is in them. This is a huge design pattern. It's the scarlet thread of redemption. Uh, W.A. Criswell calls it the scarlet thread of redemption throughout the scriptures. Okay. And Yahweh Elohim said, look, the Adam has become like one of us, knowing Tov and Ra, and so... Now, so he won't send out his hand and take also from the eights of Chava and eat and live forever, and then he doesn't finish the sentence. Just kind of lets it hang there. So like one of us, we talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago. Could, does it mean the Trinity? Does it mean a royal we? Or does it mean something else? I think the Trinity is a great explanation because the Trinity is real and it's true. Uh, the royal we, I, I don't put much stock into that one. The weird one is, remember how God loves to partner and delegate and work with when he could just do it all himself. That's why humans were created, to be his image. And he has his partners on the earth. Remember there's another population? 
the stars, right? The other spiritual beings. And he, he, just like he loves to work with humans, he loves to work with that population as well. So this is where the concept of the divine council comes from, which was certainly believed in by many, many people in Jesus' day. And you see echoes of it throughout the Hebrew Bible. He's got his staff. And so he's talking with his staff. Later, there's a thing that happens. We're going to get to in Genesis 10. Uh, some of the staff becomes corrupt. That's what Psalm 82 is all about, in case Psalm 82 has confused you. All right, moving right along. And live forever. Okay, well, oh, I'm sorry. So that he won't send out his hand and take from the tree. In other words, we don't want, we don't want these people to take from the tree of life on their own terms, just like they did with the tree of knowing good and bad. What would that create? Because they would live forever in this corrupt, disordered state of self-sovereignty and shame and sin and striving for rule over each other and grief. This kind of grief is a fate far, far worse than death. And Yahweh Elohim sent him out from the garden to work the Adama from which he was taken and he banished them. So we're gonna finish up chapter three, and we're going to hit chapter four next week, because so we are going to finish chapter three, but for the very first time in all these classes, uh, we're going to have to suspend it until next week. So we're on a cliffhanger. Do not miss next week if you possibly can, because we're going to finish this. It's so important. And chapter four, we get to see what happens in chapter three play out again. So love you guys. You are doing great. Please don't leave. Stay for Worship Wednesday.